Well, happy Friday, everyone. This is Dr. Langley Brady. Sorry, couldn't be there with you today. I'm at a research retreat uh, downtown, but I wanted to share some brief information with you, just about 10 slides or less, on kind of intro to care planning. First and foremost, I want you to please always remember that no disease exists in a vacuum. That is, everyone you meet is a combination of body, mind, spirit, emotions, relationships, and environment. Please remember this in your care planning processes. If we only treat a pathophysiological problem, the patient will never completely heal and will come back and see us more often. We have to look at everything that may potentially impact the health, well-being, or disease of those in our care. So hopefully you have just completed your Kahoot pre-assessment. If not, now's the time to do it. Some quick learning objectives, uh, stages of nursing process, summarize Nanda, Nick, and Nock, discuss how to write a nursing diagnosis, compare and contrast pathophysiological and psychosocial nursing diagnosis, and subjective and objective data. And we're going to review a non-nursing care plan, just something funny to get you thinking outside of the box, and then appraise a nursing care plan. So here's the nursing process and uh, how we use that for care planning, right? So we complete an assessment of our client, our patient, and that includes objective and objective data. From that data, we determine an appropriate diagnosis, which can be actual, meaning something's important happening right this minute and we need to take care of that, uh, a potential or risk for something that could happen to them, a syndrome. There are a few types of nursing diagnosis that are syndrome related, like post-rape syndrome, traumatic stress syndrome, uh, a few, few like that. Um, and then wellness ones, like everything's good, but it could be better. So these are gonna be health promoting um, enhanced wellness sorts of diagnoses. And then from that diagnosis, we start our plan. And it's best to always include the client and or their caregivers in this plan of care, right? And we wanna use a SMART goal. And SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, that's very, very, very important because uh, if something isn't realistic for that patient, then why are we going there? Uh, and then timely or are bound with a time constraint. And to help meet those goals, we're going to have interventions. And interventions consist of nursing assessments, nursing treatments, and nursing education. And then lastly, our evaluation. So did our patient meet our goal? not meet the goal or partially meet the goal and why and then from that evaluation stage there is a cyclical loop that happens where okay well we didn't meet the goal so what do we need to change what interventions can we change to further impact meeting that goal or do we need to go back and change the goal altogether. Maybe this patient has changed somewhat and they're not going to meet that goal now. Um, perhaps we need to go all the way back to our assessment because maybe there's different subjective or objective data now and that would impact our goal and our interventions. Lots of things, but the, the cycle just loops back around and back around until our patients meet whatever that goal was, whether it's to stabilize uh, a condition to improve a condition or or not maybe um, to have a peaceful demise you know depending on um, what their diagnosis and prognosis are so moving along from there really quickly nanda uh, international it's a, a professional association that names the knowledge of nursing 
reflecting nursing practice and research, and which is used in education and informatics. And you can go to the site nanda.org to get all sorts of information about NANDA. So NANDA approves the nursing diagnosis that we're allowed to use. And these diagnoses change every time they revise their publication. Now this is a group of people anyone can apply and join and help create nursing diagnoses. And I'm giving you an example. Several years ago, um, that, well, they've recently changed the format of their book, but years and years and years in the past, they would always have a section of lesser used nursing diagnoses in the very back of the book. And probably, I guess it was about six, eight years ago, uh, at a American Holistic Nursing Association conference, we were told that the nursing diagnosis of impaired energy field was being considered for removal from NANDA. And so AHNA surveyed all energy practitioners in the United States. So those are people that use healing touch, Reiki, acupressure, acupuncture, anybody that works within that energy field around uh, a human or an animal for that fact, but we're humans in, in this case. And um, then from there, they took that data and completed a conceptual analysis of disturbed energy field, and then wrote up and published that information, submitted it to NANDA. The board read this and then voted to keep impaired energy field as a NANDA approved nursing diagnosis. Like, Yay! The political process is beautiful, um, but it, it's a very interesting process. So if people are utilizing a diagnosis and it's behooving the patient or the client, then they're likely to stay. Okay. Um, and with those, NANDA creates what we call NIC or our nursing intervention classifications and NOC are the outcome classifications and it's types of professional language for nurses to use. And you have examples of NAND approved nursing diagnosis for you in D2L, just an abbreviated list. I do have a huge book that I bring with me to lab every day. So the next time I see you guys, if you wanna look at my book, I will be more than happy to share it. Now we're gonna just talk a little bit. I know these are funny little stick figures here but we're gonna compare and contrast nursing diagnoses, right? So pathophysiological nursing diagnoses. These are the things, you, what can you see, hear, smell, feel, touch, read, et cetera? And we'll get into that in just a minute. Whereas our psychosocial nursing diagnosis, as a dear friend of mine, um, Professor Beverly Collins once said, it's what can you not see? And I'm gonna try to see this right here and pull up something really quickly if it will let me and I don't know where they all disappeared because I had everything here there we go okay so let's pull up pathophysiological nursing diagnosis okay um if we think about this little fella here right so pathophysiological think of what we could see right so what we could see if we had perhaps here on the arm an IV, then I could think of nursing diagnosis that would be related to anything with the fluid, you know, fluid and electrolyte imbalances, fluid overload. Um, let's see what else, any cardiovascular type of nursing diagnosis, impaired tissue perfusion, things like that. If my patient had a cast on, way here, um, impaired mobility, acute pain from a fracture, uh, maybe impaired tissue perfusion because there's edema located in that area. Likewise, if there was a urinary catheter here, uh, impaired urinary Im elimination. Um, let's see, what other things could we have? Uh, if instead of Foley catheter, we were talking about maybe um, a fecal management system um, for C. diff perhaps, and maybe they had 
impaired bowel elimination. Um, perhaps they came in emaciated, they're anorexic, and so that would be impaired nutrition, less than body requirements, or perhaps this person was morbidly obese, and then it would be impaired nutrition greater than body requirements. Um, all sorts of things that just by seeing your patient, you can gather. Now, so think of somebody that comes in with a respiratory distress, right? They're having problems breathing, maybe they're wheezing, maybe they're coughing, a very short of breath. So things like ineffective airway clearance, ineffective breathing pattern uh, would be great. Uh, you could see that, you could hear that. Um, maybe their oxygen saturations are low. So all those sorts of things could be great pathophysiological nursing diagnoses. Now let's click over on psychosocial nursing diagnoses. So again, what can we not see, right? What do you think? So perhaps, um, see if it'll let me write some stuff in here. Let's write, what about neglect? Homeless. Used. Um, physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually, financially uh, for our el more our elderly um, people. Let's see, what about fear? It's not going to let me type. Image. Knowledge. Deficit. Um, lots of other things like, uh, what do you think? Anxiety. I mean, you may be able to see anxiety or fear. Just depends. Anxiety, neglect, homelessness. Um, maybe they can't afford their medications. So I'll just say poverty, what will lump it all under um, socioeconomically disadvantaged. You maybe that's something you can't see when everybody comes in and they're in the same hospital gown that everybody has on. You know, the, the, they're clean and they have a hospital gown on. And so you may not see the torn and dirty clothes or the missing shoes upon admission or how filthy they were, that maybe they were homeless or could not afford clothing, uh, can't afford their medication, don't have any support in their home. Um, we can't see potential things in their environment that would cause undue stress. Um, and we know that increased stress leads to increased inflammation in the body, which causes disease. There's lots of things, psychosocial things, that we can't see. And this is where taking time to talk to your patient is crucial. Spend the time to talk to your patient. Ask those questions. Ask open-ended questions, maybe difficult questions. Because without doing so, we're not going to fully understand what's impacting this person's wellness or disease and be able to help them work through that uh, to attain their goals. Okay. Now, we're going to go back to the next one. Oh, I'll step back and back to the um, pathophysiological objective, objective data, right? Objective data. I wanted to touch that real quick. Um, we talked about this in lab. What you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you feel, what you touch in the room, and then other things like what do you read in a lab report? Uh, lab work or radiology report. 
what do you read um, from the Dynamap, right? Their vital signs, you know, from the thermometer, the pulse oximeter, those sorts of things. So all your objective data is going to be things that you read, see, hear, touch, feel, smell, okay? And those subjective data things are what people tell you. It's what they say. It's what the family member says, and you have to write it in quotes, okay? Now, I'm gonna skip to the next one. We're gonna say how to write a nursing diagnosis. So the parts of it, the P-E-S-S, -S, right? The problem, the etiology, the signs and symptoms, plain and simple. For this one, it says acute pain related to, or that's at R slash T, related to tissue ischemia, right? They're not getting blood flow to say their fingers. Um, as evidenced by the statement of, I feel pain. Oh, I'm sorry, his is in his chest. <laughs> uh, anyway, so for example, you could say uh, acute pain related to surgical procedure as evidenced by, uh, it really hurts in quotation marks and then I also want to add, see, it really hurts is a subjective data. I want to have subjective data with objective data for all of my nursing diagnoses, if at all humanly possible, in particular pain. So this should say as evidenced by statement of, quote, I feel pain in my chest, unquote, and rating of eight, on numerical rating scale or NRS, okay? Or that zero to 10 numerical rating scale. You have to have the problem, the etiology, what brought them in there, and quite often that's gonna be a medical diagnosis. Um, and then as evidenced by a statement and then subjective data and your objective data, okay? So I've got something really humorous and I can share it with you guys later. This is a non-nursing care plan example. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Let me grab this one up here. So this is one I use with a lot of students to help them understand the process of filling out a care plan and, and how it works without adding anything nursing into it, okay? <laughs> so. This is knowledge deficit. Knowledge deficit is one of those psychosocial, right, diagnoses. Knowledge deficit related to what? Related to toast making, okay? I call this my burnt toast care plan. And it's evidenced by, this is where you're gonna see that objective data, burnt toast, anxiety, refusal to make toast, and stating, here's that subjective, quote, I never get it right, unquote, right? So let's go down. So in the assessment section, we have subjective and objective data. So subjective data includes patients, complains of always burning his toast. Patient states, quote, I can't do it. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I never get it right, unquote. Patient states, quote, I'm hungry and I want toast, unquote. Plain and simple, right? So let's go to objective data. Now these are things, remember, that I can see, smell, hear, feel, touch, don't taste anything in your patient, <laughs> please, um, or read in a chart, right? So objective data, the kitchen smells of smoke and smoky haze observed. The toast was brownish black in color. I created my own toastedness scale of zero being not toasted and 10 being burnt. And so I have toast rating 10 on the toastedness numerical rating scale of zero to 10. <laughs> yes, I created that. Uh, anxious appearing patient, distraught and hungry patient. Now, think about our goal. Our goal has to be a SMART goal, it has to be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So I wrote, 
patient will increase his toast making knowledge and make edible toast by the end of the shift and that's going to be evidenced by patient will state that he understands how to make toast and will successfully demonstrate how to make two slices of toast by the end of the shift. Okay, so the measurable part is he can successfully demonstrate how to make two slices of toast. Okay, um, ideally a better way to do it would be a pre and post test of his toast making ability, but I haven't had time to make a test, a uh, pre and post test for that. So interventions, our nursing interventions are divided into three different categories. There's assessment, treatment, and then education. So things that we're going to assess, assess the patient's readiness to learn. If he doesn't want to learn, no matter how much we want to teach him, he's not going to learn, right? Assess the patient's baseline tolage, <laughs> toast making knowledge. Does he know how to make toast? Find out what he knows or he doesn't know. Then you need to assess that toaster and see how it operates, right? And remember, for all interventions, we have to have rationale over here. So I'm going to assess the toaster operation. That's to rule out any mechanical problems. I mean, maybe it's just not working. Maybe it's broken. Um, and then we want to assess that patient's toast making ability. That's that kind of pretest, right? It gives us a baseline of what the patient knows how to do. Now, treatment. These are things we're going to do. So, I said we're going to test toast making on each of the five settings per the manufacturer's directions of the toaster, right? Remember each one of those, those numbers on the side, one, two, three, four, and five on the dial, that's minutes, the length of time during which the toast is exposed to heat. So I'm gonna put a piece of bread in and do it for one minute and two minutes of three, four, and five and see how it works, right? Because maybe it's not functioning correctly. And then I may even test different types of bread for desired toastedness. You know, say maybe a setting of three, but a slice of white toast versus wheat toast versus sourdough. Um, and then create an instructional reference card and place it somewhere near the toaster. And that would provide a backup. The rationale would provide a backup resource until the patient demonstrates self-sufficiency in toast making. And then provide praise during the learning process. So praising effort and accomplishments improve motivation and self-esteem of the learner. These would be great. Now when it comes to education, you'd provide patient with toast making education using a variety of teaching methods, hands-on, written, verbal, and visual, because using a variety of teaching methods will help better help the patient learn, right? Now, when it comes to evaluation, to evaluate whether the patient met the goal. Now, mind you, this, this goal here, this is way, oop, way back. I can't draw on this one. This is way back here, this goal, all right? So when we're evaluating it, we're evaluating if the patient met this SMART goal right here, not evaluating each one of the things that we did. No, I mean, you can talk about those, but we're evaluating if the patient met this big SMART goal right here in this column. So I said goal was met, and then I need to say how it was met. So the patient verbalized how to make toast, patient verbalized understanding of toaster settings one through five, and changes needed for different types of bread. Patient successfully made two slices of edible toast by the end of the shift, and patient stated, quote, I did it. I made toast. And then patient ate the toast and was no longer hungry, right? Wouldn't that be just the ideal successful uh, care plan for, for every patient? Now, we want to think about a nursing care plan example. I need to get a sip of water here real quick. Now what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna bring up one um, 
I think it was either the first or the second care plan that a student did last fall uh, for 6,700 clinical. And, and it's just, you know, their care plan, and I've got writing all over it, and I covered up their names. So you can't see it. Okay. And, and just go over some things, and don't freak out with the amount of writing that's all over here because it's okay. Uh, this is how we learn. So the diagnosis was acute pain. You see right here, and it says related to shunt placement surgery. That's fine. As evidenced by pain score, eight out of 10. Well, I, I want more than that. Um, pain score of eight out of 10 on which scale? Okay, faces scale, numerical rating scale, and I also want some subjective data there. You quote the patient, my head really hurts. Okay. Um, when we look at the assessment data, patient reported pain score of 8 out of 10 during pain assessment. That's fine, but I would want to quote that. Quote that. Um, but this is also right here is also um, objective data. That's why I've got it down here, 8 out of 10 on that numerical rating scale. Okay. Um, also, it says patient described poor outlook on life because of pain. Well, I would rather see that written as subjective data is supposed to be written. So here, quote, my pain will never get better, unquote. It gives you a, a deeper understanding of exactly how that patient's feeling, right? Um, and then, of course, there was no other objective data here at all. Like maybe, I'm sorry, there was patient would grimace during assessment. So, um, Patient grimacing during assessment, uh, numerical rating scale, eight out of 10. It's, it, that's an acute pain uh, from surgery, so I would expect to see elevated heart rate. So heart rate, you know, 126, respiratory rate, 26. Um, BP, you know, is probably elevated as well. The, those sorts of changes you see typically with, with acute pain uh, versus chronic pain, you won't see those sorts of things. Maybe patient holding his head, patient guarding, patient wanting the light off um, and no noise and because it, it makes his head feel worse. Those sorts of things are going to be in the objective data. OK. Now, if we're looking at um, a goal, so this was goal was patient will report less than six out of 10 for numeric pain score. Patient will mood outlook on life will improve. Um, so for now, until you're, you're probably in your last semester, it's best to stick with one goal. And the goal needs to be related to this diagnosis right here of acute pain, okay? So mood is not related exactly to that diagnosis. That's talking about the pain. If we make somebody's pain go down, they're, they're likely to have an improved mood. That's maybe correlation, not causation, but, but it's probable. So we need to have a SMART goal here, and this is not a SMART goal. Um, and think about six out of 10. So, if I'm at eight out of 10 and I just said surgery, I think I might want to be less than six out of 10. And this is something that you need to discuss with the patient. You know, where do they want their pain? Does that patient want to want to be zero? Is zero attainable? Maybe a two is attainable. Um, are they OK being a six? I would not be OK having a six all the time in that bed. OK, absolutely not. It's going to depend on that person's um, relativeness to their pain experience, as we talked about in lab. So it should say something like patient will report um, less than two out of 10 on a numerical pain rating scale by the end of my shift. So then it's measurable. It might, might be attainable and it's got a time constraint to it. OK, and it's very specific. Um, and then, of course, here here I wrote, you know, patient will rate pain less than three on numerical rating scale by end of shift. Something similar to that. And when it comes to interventions now, 
this little clue under the box. This is an assessment treatment education. You really, really, really need to separate those in those three categories. It makes it make so much more sense and help you understand how it should flow. And think about writing a care plan is writing it for a nurse that's coming on to your shift to take care of this patient and you're going home and if it's not written down on the sheet of paper, they're not going to do it. Now we know that's not the case, but if you end up having no electronic system and everything is written in that handwritten care plan out in that field hospital, you better believe you better have everything on there you want someone to do or it is probably not going to get done. So, um, I mean, this this is fine here, but this is not standard nursing language according to Nanda. So look at this. So make sure patient is receiving prescribed pain medicines and before going home, make sure patient has a plan to get medicine from pharmacy. OK, and remember, these are first care plans ever ever done in nursing school. So you, we only go up from here and, and I consider this a good start for a care plan. So for assessments, for me, I would want to assess this patient's pain every four hours in PRN. And then I need to reassess pain 30 minutes after any administration of pain medications or any other treatments that, that might reduce pain. I also want to assess my patient Q shift in PRN. And that's that head to toe physical assessment because changes in that physical assessment can impact pain. If they're starting to have edema somewhere that they didn't have before, edema causes pain. If they have some decreased perfusion in that area, that's going to cause pain. There's all sorts of other things that can impact that pain uh, perception that I might see on a physical assessment. Always assess your patient. Um, and then, of course, um, we're going to assess our vital signs Q4 hours in PRN because there's changes in vital signs can indicate acute um, pain changes as well. Um, let's see. The other one they talked about discuss with patient alternative methods of pain relief, such as music therapy, meditation, or guided imagery. That is good. We talked about that in post conference that day. Um, so, we're going to talk about treatment. So, we want to remember. A uh, dependent nursing function would be to administer pain medications as ordered. I, that's a dependent thing. I can't do it unless there's an order for it. Um, but there are independent nursing uh, treatments that we can do. Let's just use calm, soothing voice, dim the lights, reduce extraneous noises in the room, um, provide a warm blanket, offer complementary therapies. That, that are allowed in your facility and, and those were mentioned above. So some guided imagery, music therapy, meditation, pet therapy, aromatherapy, uh, all those sorts of things, massage, heat or cold. Um, those are independent nursing functions. You have to just know when to apply heat and cold because if you apply the wrong one at the wrong time, then you've done damage to the patient instead of help them feel better. Um, so just know that you, you want to make sure you know what's going on. And even things such as prayer. Prayer helps a, a lot of people. Uh, so if they're amenable to prayer, um, feel free to pray with them or, or get a chaplain to come pray with them as well. OK, um, and things like repositioning you know, turning every two hours, those sorts of things um, may help alleviate some pain. Guarding, splinting, things like that as well. And then education. Education wasn't discussed in this care plan, but I added some. So education. So we want to educate this patient on um, early. Darn, little things won't move away here. I can't see this is in my way. There we go. Um, education so early reporting of pain for better control. So we want to tell the patient we don't ever want to have to chase pain, right? Don't hold on and hold on and hold on and hold on and don't push that button asking for pain medicine because you want to see how long you can go between doses or you're tough and you know you can take it a little bit longer before you take pain medicine. Those sorts of things make pain medication more difficult. Uh, to work. It, it doesn't work as well. It takes more of it to work. It takes longer to work. 
you want to not be chasing pain. You want to stay in front of it. So early reporting of pain so we can better control it is ideal. Um, and then the use of non-pharmacologic or um, complementary therapies for pain. You may want to educate them on, on some new new thing, even if it's you know, guided imagery or some deep breathing or something that may help them as well. Um, and then, of course, there's always rationale. And these really need to be from your textbook, okay? Uh, which is why at the bottom of almost all sheets, you can't see it on here, it got cut off. There is a reference place for you to write where you got this information from. Um, you're just starting school. You don't know all the rationale for interventions yet. So you have to pull them from somewhere, okay? And then under the evaluation, this was really sad, is a patient was discharged before evaluation could be completed. You know, sometimes that happens. But ideally, we want to then go back and decide whether this goal was met and how, uh, if it was partially met and how and why, or if it was not met and why. Uh, because if it was partially met, we need to go back and see what other interventions we can add so that we can meet that goal. Or if it was not met, maybe we need to go back and reassess our patient, uh, get some more subjective and objective data. Maybe we need to tweak our goal a bit. Um, maybe what the original goal was is just not going to be realistic or attainable for this patient and, and go back in that cyclical process. Okay, so that is my student example. And I think I'm going to wrap it up there. This is long enough talking to you. I hope you enjoyed just uh, going over a few things here. I know it's brief. We could do care plans for hours and hours and hours. But please go to the next step uh, on your paper, which is the interactive uh, care planning Kahoot. I hope you enjoy it. There's a little video in there, uh, and then you'll answer some questions related to that video. And then work on care plans yourself. So take care, and hope you all have a a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.